for the court to come on. And the first topic I want to bring up is actually, you know, a change that I've noticed over the years is the uh, amount of courtesy that exists between providers or lack thereof. Um, and I can tell you that, you know, that's more and more prevalent, at least anecdotally, because most of us are employed now. So in the old days, we knew every specialist in our uh, area, we communicated, we shared patients, and in the process, we've developed a mutual respect and dependence. And the economic side of it, of course, is if you're an employed physician, you're not really looking for word of mouth or the other physician's referrals. And so you become really very independent of other providers. So if I don't want to be nice to Dr. Braun anymore, I could technically <laughs> <laughs> I could technically do it and not see a negative effect on my practice. Okay? Whereas in the past I could not possibly do that in my service area and not see a negative impact on my practice. So it becomes really an honor system now as opposed to, you know, it's part of what you do, it's part of what you do to grow your practice, etc. The other thing is the quality-based payments. So again, what you're depending on is whatever your data is, you're becoming a little bit more independent from other providers. So uh, is that impacting that interaction? Again, this is me wondering because as I looked for data, there's no research on these topics, and I hope they will be. Um, and one first sentence here is, Really, it's important not to assume that other providers are idiots. And, and, and that's a good start because a lot of times we're so separated in our silos that when we share patients and we're looking at the charts, I see anecdotally that there's a lot of jump into conclusion. And I assume it, it happens on the other side. In fact, I know it does because I took patients in the hospital. I seen people in consultation. I used to admit patients to Mercy and May Med and St. Mary's and CMMC, and I've seen when people come from the nursing home what kind of reaction people have in the ER. You know, oh, yet again, you know, we're getting other patient from so-and-so facility. And a quick uh, jump into conclusion. Um, I find that, you know, giving people the benefit of, and again, this is more for our patient care. So if we ask ourselves when we don't give the other providers the benefit of the doubt, when we're not positively communicating, when we're not actually getting actual data to base our decisions on, is that harm in our patients? And at least we could say possibly in this case, right? So it's, it's possibly unethical when we do it. So it's for our interests of our patients, we've got to at least give others the benefit of the doubt and not throw them under the bus. We've had uh, a case, uh, a wound care case that went to the hospital um, uh, three, four years ago that is actually a bigger case now, but it, it, it started becoming an issue because the hospital saw the wound and went, oh my God. And it snowballed from there, but that particular case, that wound actually started in that hospital. And that person who said, oh my God, didn't know that fact, okay? And imagine when they hear about it later from their lawyers that it's actually yours. Um, and again, focusing on what's right for our patients sometimes means taking our ego out of the picture. Now, a lot of uh, physicians out there may not be very familiar with geriatricians' work, et cetera, but if they actually listen, uh, they may be things that are actually new to them that's not their forte. Uh, being heroes at the expense of others, I run into this all the time where I can be a hero. And it's actually fun to do it. Uh, granted, the patient won't remember the next day. Well, most of them don't because they have dementia. But it is good for our egos when somebody says, oh my God, nobody ever told me this. And then you're looking at the chart and, you know, they are on blood pressure medication, and they're telling you, nobody told me blood pressure is a big issue. And so, you know, kind of riding that train eventually causes a problem with the other provider's work. 
because if, you know, they may go back to that provider and do some work and you just damage that relationship by acting like a hero. Um, and one thing I find very useful is that we, I find it easier to focus on what I'm doing instead of throwing other people under the bus. You know, to say, okay, I can't speak to what happened in the hospital. I can tell you what we're doing now. And I reviewed all the data, and this is what we're doing now. That's actually a very neutral and positive attitude to have without necessarily over, you know, kind of washing over any mistakes <coughs> they may have made. It's not, you know, the focus of that conversation unless it becomes an issue later. Um, the negative interactions that I find against from the provider standpoint, um, not leaving a message that's negative with other physicians offices is a good start. You know, if, if when I'm calling somebody, I'm not saying I'm calling because I'm really PO'd about this patient. You got to call and leave a respectful message. And in the old days, I actually used to stop what I'm doing and call a physician if I get a call. Um, it's, you know, and I would hope that most physicians still think that way. But I can tell you also that Sometimes we get communication between providers by starting with the wrong principle. Like if a provider is calling, but they're not open to hearing their geriatric point of view, or if you call a surgeon and you're not open to hearing the surgical point of view, it becomes a problem. Um, an example for this was a case, a 105-year-old uh, lady who lived in an independent living comes into rehab from the hospital and she's on a small dose antidepressant. And she's one of those um, acutest dementia cases you could see. It's really on the extreme positive side of the dementia spectrum, where nothing faced her. She didn't mind that she didn't um, remember anybody. And she didn't mind that she was in a new place. She seemed to like us. She loved the food. And I'm thinking, well, this person who I'm getting rehab for why would I need to continue the antidepressant, which is really just five milligrams of Celexa. So uh, I stopped the medicine and I got a call two days later from her physician saying, I'm calling about this pen. I thought, oh, how nice. <laughs> 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 Somebody's calling me from home, you know, following up on their patient. And then he said, well, I'm concerned about stopping the Celexa. And I said, uh, why? You know, she, she seems very happy. She's not under stress from what's going on in her world. And he goes, well, dementia is depressing. And I'm trying not to be, na you know, I'm saying, okay, well, not all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like if somebody is very poor and gets demented and can't remember that anymore, they're happy. There are many circumstances where dementia is not inducing depression. But I didn't word it that way. I basically just said, well, not all the time. And I, you know, the, um, the criteria are that we eliminate as much as we can if it's causing potential harm. And his last words were, well, I'll put her back on it when she comes to my office. I said, OK. And that was the last time we had a conversation. Uh, but again, it's just this concept of I don't need you and this is what I want you to do and you're in a different discipline and I know better. Uh, that, you know, we didn't used to have that as much. The other uh, example is actually when surgeons, we, deal, we do that a lot and actually I think there should be more work between surgery departments and rehab and post-acute because there's a lot of interaction, at least sharing of patients. So uh, in this case, you know, most surgeons would like to continue the same meds, even the medical meds, regardless of whether they affect the surgical aspect of care or not. And um, this surgeon who shall remain nameless, uh, she called and left a very angry message about me stopping committing. Now, that particular patient was actually my patient. So I sent her from the nursing home to have surgery for a hip fracture, came back, 
And during the review, she had an INR of five from the hospital. And they were holding it. They gave her vitamin K. They restarted it. And I thought, you know, I have better options. So I, I, started, I switched medication. And the doctor was calling, left a message with the nurse, really very angry message. So that created counter-transference. <laughs> And I'm like, okay, so I'll get back to her when I'm doing my rounds, uh, since she's really that angry and not very positive. So I eventually called, and, and the gist of that conversation was that that's my patient, and I'm saying that's my patient. <laughs> but really, both of us are supposed to be taking care of the same person. And I think if the delineation of roles was reintroduced in people's education and saying, you know, the primary care doctor, the medical doctor is actually having a role. The internist or the geriatrician doing the work is not an intern for the surgeon. And if that's understood, then they can do that work much better. And, um, but I just bring that as, again, I don't think it's isolated, but I don't think enough research is being done on it. And it's creating a lot of either no communication because it's so negative all the time to the detriment of patient care or communication that does. Um, the other thing I want to bring up is really conflicts of interest. Um, and, and it's really emerging more now that the incentive is not better patient care. <laughs> like the incentive is not, oh, my patients would love me. I'll be known in the community as a good doctor. The incentive is I'm going to get $10,000 a year more from Medicare if I did this and this and this. And so, uh, again, it's not that that's bad by itself. It's just the unintended cultural consequences within our own world now um, that creates a conflict of interest. So if you're doing something, is it good for you or for the patient? If you're meeting criterias, you know, if you're doing something that um, – uh, is based on a quality measure. Is it good for you or for the patient? You know, we, I'm going to bring you a quick example for the criteria for quality measures. You know, the vaccination. We used to hold off vaccinating when people are acutely ill because the immune system is not working. So really very ill for them to mount an immune response when you give them a vaccination. But now, because we want to meet that criteria, what do we do? We give it to them as soon as we get them so we can check it off and move on to the next thing. And I'm sure there will eventually be studies to look at the efficacy when you do it in a systematic way like this so you get the masses and not miss as many versus waiting and doing it later where you miss a lot more, but you're actually doing it properly and you might get better results from the vaccination. Um, but overall, I think the balance should always favor the patient. So if we're, if we're thinking of, you know, is this good for me, bad for me, good for the patient, bad for the patient, the golden rule, I think, should be that, by and large, should favor the patient. The examples of things that are actually being done that benefit us, that have negative impact on patients, you would think that there aren't many examples of that. But there are. They're emerging examples. Um, I remember three, four years ago in uh, Springbrook, we had a patient who was vascular surgery, had a bypass of lower extremity, came to rehab, very healthy, walking, talking, uh, early 70s. Uh, Drive-in, very independent, and was on vacation from Florida. So he had Humana in Florida, and his primary care was in Florida. and. Uh, we had kept him uh, after two, three days because he developed an infection on the site. So the surgical site developed erythema around it, drainage started to smell, and we started to treat that with antibiotics. And then he was going to stay three, four days and be discharged. And we, you know, the team said we need to keep him. So I get a call from the primary care physicians in, in Florida for this case. And again, I really was impressed at first. Like, okay, <laughs> this person is calling me from Florida, and he's a primary care, and just check in 
on his patient. And he introduced himself as the primary physician for so-and-so. And we continued the conversation, and slowly during the conversation, it turned out that he, you know, it sounded like he's trying to discharge him sooner. And uh, it didn't click until halfway through the conversation. I said, do you work for the insurance company? And he goes, yeah, we have a contract. But I said, you introduced yourself as the primary care doc. He says, I am the primary care doc. So the Humana plan for Florida, and again, I named them because it's a transparent world. They, people should know what systems do. So Humana in Florida contracts primary care doctors to do case management for them, to reduce costs of uh, outside uh, care. So that doctor was actually calling as a case manager, right? Is that ethical? And when are we, well, how often will that happen until it becomes illegal, right? Not to introduce yourself and not to delineate where you stand on that conversation. Like, if you call as a representative of the insurance company, there's nothing wrong with that. Again, it would be even good to have a direct conversation so they get first-hand information. But for that person to be wearing a hat of a primary care doctor and the hat of administrator or case manager, <coughs> it's problematic. And uh, interrupt me. Another example I, I want to give about conflict of interest, you know, when you're, when you're a medical director, where is your loyalty? Is it to the resident, to the patient, or to the facility? Your primary. Like if push came to shove, which one do you pick? As providers, as physicians, we're required to benefit our patients and do no harm, regardless of what kind of additional roles we take. So, you know, I, I'll bring an example, and again, those are actual cases where, um, you know, if you have a, a resident and assisted living and you're told about certain aspect of their care and decline, and you say, well, maybe they need higher level of care, right? What is that beneficial to you as a medical director in your role? And is that going to make your administrator happy? No, but it's your job. <laughs> and I actually heard those words come out of people who say, you know, but you're our medical director. I'm like, yes, and all things being equal, I do promote you and your best interests, but not at the expense. I have backup. <laughs> uh, so actually, that was an important slide that I wanted to show you. But uh, <laughs> uh, the slide basically reads, which physician physician characteristics serve physician interests most of the ones I'm just going to tell you. Now, using your imagination. Imagine this slide reads, ethical and patient focus. Now, actually, I want to see, see a show of hands. How many people think that's a good characteristic for a doctor? No. Compliant. And that basically means with quality indicators and protocols. <laughs> so, okay. so if the American College of Physicians in the hospital says three antibiotics for iatrogenic pneumonia, which they consider the nursing home <coughs> patients iatrogenic pneumonia, it's not community acquired, it's hospital acquired. So you get three antibiotics. And you're thinking, well, this one is not as sick as most people. They're not in the ICU, they're in the med surge floor. I'm not going to do three antibiotics. So again, I'm just giving you that caveat. Guidelines are just guidelines. True. It used to be. It used to be more as a guideline. Now it's more as a protocol.
Right, and I can tell you that's again takes us back to the conflict of interest issue. For example, most doctors are employed by hospitals. So what do hospitals do for salary? There's a base salary and there's incentives. What is your incentive based on? Your compliance, right? So sometimes the first one, which is ethical and patient-centered, is in conflict with your other characteristics that get you money. Uh, how about responsive? By show of hands? All right. Now, what if responsive means, can I have a UA? Can I have Risperdal? Can I have a sleeping pill? And I'm not talking about the nurse <laughs> asking for themselves. That's for your patient. All right. How about flexible? So if you're responsive, does that mean you have to respond to the policy? I was, I was going to jump to the same thing. Responsive, right. but you still have to support the policy. Right. But what, what, would pe what would cause people to characterize you as responsive? So if you're responding, but you're saying no most of the time, and people are doing a survey about you, because that's what they do so that they can pay you, do you think you'll get high marks if you're saying no, 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 no? Not on the first point. All right. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> All right. I take that point. All right. How about flexible? Show of hands? Now, flexible sometimes means on principle. Can mean on principle, right? You say one thing one day, you get pushed back, you say something else. So again, as long as it's not in conflict with the first characterization, it's good. But these are not about you know qualities in a physician. These are characterizations that eventually, over time, if you're working for a, an organization, you're going to be characterized a certain way. If you're inflexible about principles, that may cost you. So they may result in conflict of interest. Team player. Good, right? Right. Does team player mean saying yes to every pharmacy recommendation you see and dietary recommendation <coughs> and hospice recommendation, which we'll get later? No. All right. But again, I'm just bringing these things up because in the mind of a physician, one thing means one thing, which is good. But in the mind of an organization, good sometimes means bad because it's characterized a certain way. Now back to my picture. So that's actually from Kittery Point two weeks ago. And those of you who comes to the housewarming party will know where it is. So um, the daily interactions that we have you know, with, the, with the outside world. So each silo, we're post-acute. Do we deal with the hospitals every week? Yes, right? Every day, yes. And the daily interactions is sometimes, you know, still not causing us to communicate. <laughs> is that to the best interest of our patient? No, it's definitely not. And the siloing includes lack of understanding of logistics. And I'll, I'll give you just a brief example of how we can make it better. I mean, if, if I understood that the ER is not a geriatric unit, and not to expect them not to give my patient an Ativan when they go there, my life would be much better and I'll have better quality of life. Why? Because I'm not upset about that all the time. And that's one reason we train people, you know, not to send people to the hospital unnecessarily. Why? Because the hospital is not a geriatric unit. If you had a problem with a patient being angry and restless, imagine what happens when you remove them from their environment, put them in a busy ER, and now they have them in a small little space that they have to stay in. What are they going to do? They can't follow geriatric protocols. They're going to follow what they need to do. So. If you want the best interest for your patient, you should understand that logistic and avoid sending them in the first place. But once you sent them, don't complain that they got out of it, okay? 
because that's what they do in the ER. They need to control them for that five minutes, five hours, six hours that they have them there. Understanding that logistic improves patient care. Now the flip side of it is the dismissiveness of, of the other side of this world. Now if an ER or hospitalist doesn't think you do much, <laughs> right? And so sometimes that results in keeping people longer, okay? And I find one of the biggest logistical hurdles is that um, when I read discharge summaries, I don't find educated information about where that patient lives or where they're going. So it would say independent living. Patient is going to go back to assisted living, and it turns out to be independent living. Or patient is going back to a skilled facility, and they're in an assisted living. Or patient is going back to long-term care, and they're in independent living. So all these areas have different skills, different availability of services, et cetera. And for the other side not to learn that, it's a problem for that patient care. You know, if they send somebody with IVs to an assisted living, it doesn't happen that often, but it can happen sometimes where you say, you know, they have home health, they can come and do one <coughs> IV like they do at home. And that creates a nightmare for some um, facility. One thing back to physicians, it's hands off medical care ethical. Sometimes, you know, it's not as unethical in the spectrum, and I'll tell you later, you know, what those cases would be, but in general, even though you may make everybody's life easier as a physician by saying, okay, you have a process that I'm going to deal with that patient care once I do my admission, for example. I'm going to let you trans send the transfer summary med list to the pharmacy so you can be expedient. You can get your work done faster. And then I'm going to deal with the meds later. Do you ever see meds when you do your admission that shouldn't have been there? So now the ethical question is, why didn't we take care of it on admission? Was having the pharmacy send the meds faster is an overriding priority over patient care? So again, these are questions I raise because they come up. And the processes that we develop sometimes contradict the flow of work for certain disciplines, but it's better care. So hands off medical care, in my opinion, or at least in my world, I'm hands off if I'm asked to be hands off. If I do something and I'm told, we're fine. <laughs> we know, but thank you. Then you can be hands off because you did your work, you tried, and then that <coughs> creates other issues which we're not gonna get into some of it we will when it comes to patient autonomy and how much the doctor is forced to do based on that autonomy, even if they think it's harmful. A different slide. I'm being very careful when I hit slide forward because I can't go back. All right, how about the ethics of therapeutic interchange? Okay, all things being equal, it's been established that, you know, using generics, using other things, not only is it the same, it's saving the system a lot of money, billions of dollars. And so in doing that, you actually go to the principle of justice. You save money, you have more money to spend on more people, and you have better access to care and better access to certain treatment. Um, in, in our small facility world, if I, save money on the run-of-the-mill daily meds. I'm sure Catherine won't complain when I prescribe Procrit once in a while, <coughs> which is not covered by anybody. Why? Because I had some money to sa that's saved that I can use. Um, and that improves patient care. So saving money is not bad just because it's saving money. However, if it's systematic, if you're going to switch everything regardless of that patient, regardless of what the physician thinks, I'll give you a quick example. Orally dissolving tablets for antipsychotics. We use them very rarely, but we do use them. When we do use them, they're very 
much needed. Like you need a specific med that actually dissolves so fast that you can treat a person in a crisis with. And, and there's a generic version of them. And again, I don't have any conflict of interest. I don't do any pharmacy talks. Don't take any money from anybody. But I find that the orally dissolving generic version is not good. I didn't take the medicine to test the effect. <laughs> but I did actually check the pill, put it in water, see if it dissolves, you know, put it on a wet surface, see it, if it dissolves. The generic is a paste. So it gets pasty. And what happens when people are in a crisis and you give them a medication that you're giving them a medicine against their will, basically? It's a crisis. They spit it out. So if it's dissolved, less gets spit out. If it's paste, more gets spit out. Patient doesn't get good treatment. Now, try convincing a pharmacy on insurance about that. Is it ethical to approve that interchange? I think it's not. Is it hard for us to fight back? Yes. Is it sometimes pointless? Yes. That's when our relationship with the facilities comes in. When all fails, we say, look, could we pay for it just for a week and then move on? And people who are patient centers, they do that, OK? And, and I also can tell you with the therapeutic interchange issue, that takes us back to the hospital nursing home interaction. The lack of, of awareness of economics of rehab or post-acute care is raising expectation of what kind of drugs, what kind of treatments you could do in post-acute rehab. So when we have interactions, if we can improve on that, when a physician you know, is asking for Lovenox for a month and not knowing that that will eat up 20% of that daily rate with one drug, it's a big wake-up call for them if they knew that, I think. But if they're getting paid $2,000 and plus $3,000 a night in the hospital and the nursing home is getting paid $400, $500, they are never going to understand your therapeutic interchange. You're going to be that idiot from a nursing home that changed their meds. Now, the provider and nurses interaction. There are ethical issues there, too. I mean, we all do our jobs in our own silos, and you would like to think we, we are closest to nurses out of all the other disciplines. We may not see the pharmacist that often. We don't see the lab person that often, but we deal with our nurses on a daily basis. And our nurses come in different kinds and shapes, and so do the providers. So we have the entire spectrum. But there are examples of unethical behaviors on all sides. One of them um, that I've identified in the past and did education around is if you word something to a provider in order to get what you want, does that ever happen by show of hands? Anybody knows of someone who's ever done it, heard of someone who's ever done it? Right. Now what that does assumes that there's no harm to that patient. And if you're not getting that person the right treatment, and who's an expert on treatment? The nurse or the provider? That's a good point. So some people would say depends. Why? Because they bring an outlier example. They say, well, have you seen our doctor? And I'm like, well, that's a good excuse. But if you set them up like you're being doctor all the time, they're going to stop being doctor. <laughs> You've got to at least give them an opportunity to be doctors and give you the treatment. And if you don't like it, then you raise the question and say, well, you know, we've done this on this case before, and we had this issue. Etc. But to word it to get what you want is unethical because you're driving that care in a direction that's artificial. All right. Ongoing nursing education. I actually find this an ethical <laughs> dilemma sometimes because, you know, if you, Dr. Brown earlier was saying something about spending 10, 15 minutes educating a nurse about something like if there's an issue that he has to say no to and would provide the education. Now, I don't know. I mean, a lot of nurses don't take that 10 minutes positively. Does that mean the provider should stop doing it? It would be unethical to not educate our nurses the best we can to provide the best care. 
or at least potentially unethical, right? But we are driven to not do it more often than not because it's not like, oh, you spend 10 minutes and then the word on the street is, oh my God, that's a wonderful doctor. He spends 10 minutes to tell me why I can't have that. It's, it's great. We're glad to have him. No, eventually you're going to be that doctor no. And what some people will hear you say from the other side of the phone is blah, 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 blah. Right? So if you're the blah, blah doctor, that doesn't serve your reputation. But is it best for our patients to do that education? Yes. Until we burn out and we stop doing it. All right. Now this is Portsmouth. Um, I used to be there before I moved to Kittery. And that was one of the last days, and it's uh, sunrise. Extending patients' autonomy to family. I think that's going to be the subject of future research. When we will have so many problems related to that, like when we become in the nursing home and some of our kids start making decisions for us, and if we still can publish, that's when that research will come out. But so if, if a patient's autonomy, which is like the ability to make unfettered decisions about their care, is transferred in its entirety to a, a family, and it is, like a power of attorney is a power of attorney. Surrogate decision maker is surrogate decision maker. Now the rub is, as providers, as professionals, do we see that as positive? So are they making the right decisions? And have you guys had any experience when a family is making a decision but you don't agree with it? Okay. Now how ethical, I'm sorry? Or you know the patient didn't agree with it. Exactly. Oh, I mean, that's even worse when you know them so long that you know what they were thinking and now they're opposing their wishes. Uh, is there any legal ground for providers to overrule such net bad decisions? No. I mean, we have no foot to stand on when it comes to that. Now, how about when it's about a prescription? When somebody insists on an antipsychotic? You could. <coughs> but how many people do that? Right. So again, the pressure, it's, it's not about, you know, critiquing this. It's more about the pressure to do the unethical within the system, right? Now, I've had a, a patient um, who was a TBI patient years ago. And <laughs> we're laughing because some of us may remember the case. But anyway, so it was a TBI patient, had a feeding tube for a very long time, for years. And his mother decided she wants to feed him. So she wanted a, a barium swallow. Now that person, clinically, could not tolerate the mouth care. They would, you know, he constantly choked on the fluid from their mouth care. So you can imagine, if you try to put barium in their mouth, where's that barium gonna go? Right? And so I said no. And same thing, like, not on my watch, I can't do it. I later found out that she also did the mouth care. Uh, the nurses had allowed her to do it under pressure and undue influence because the toothbrush sat in her purse that she used. And the nurses didn't feel comfortable with that, but she insisted. So she was doing that as well. Anyway, that person got the barium, got an aspiration. I didn't take the patient back to that facility. The all hell broke loose for a while. <laughs> and I actually taped the conversation between the family, the ombudsman, and me to say, if I take that patient back, I cannot be forced to do X, Y, or Z. But again, an example of what a family decision can do if the patient can't object to it and you can't do anything about it. Now, can you call the ombudsman and say, help us? The answer is yes, you can, but there's nothing they can do because their mandate equates family to patient. So there's no, never a conflict between what patients want and the family. 
nothing wrong with the, you know, the good folks at the ombudsman. They're actually great people and they do their best and they know deep inside what's going on. They just can't overtly come out and say, you know, we think you should not be power of attorney. They can't do that. And that, that be, that's subject to hopefully some research. Talked about the drug. Um, uh, medication based on quality measures. Now we all know the ACE inhibitors for cardiac patients. Uh, most hospitals actually, Maine passed the law. Most states now have a law that says a pharmacist can change and add drugs based on quality measures. So long as the physician has a contract, an understanding and a signed contract with that pharmacist. It happens a lot in the hospital setting because you want to control 20 hospitalists what they do, and so you have people who are cardiac patients, they go through the cath lab, their meds are being monitored by a pharmacist, they add an ACE inhibitor once they check their renal function. You know, most of the time it does a lot of good, right? But what's on the flip side of it is that that equals money. And the measure, there's certain percentages you gotta hit to get that money. So if you end up with a lot of 90-year-olds and 100-year-olds, which our population continues to rise, and you want to compare Maine to, you know, uh, South Carolina, and you say, well, Maine is an outlier. You're doing a lot of treatments that are not by protocol. It's an issue. What I see more uh, that's a problem for me has been the statin. So the quality measure says 75 years or younger. Okay, that's when the quality measure kicks in. How many people do you have that are on a statin who are over 90? How many people you take off the statin in the post-acute care, go home, come back three months later from the hospital, <coughs> and they're back on statin? So that's a good example where the quality measure is applied more broadly than specified because of lack of full knowledge. And uh, implementation process. So it's easier for the pharmacy to say, well, cardiac stroke, these two categories, get a statin, and we'll deal with AIDS later. And that turned out, or translated eventually to mean everybody gets a statin if they're cardiac or cerebrovascular disease patients. We also see people on hospice on statin. I do all the time. Like I, I, I catch at least maybe 10 a year, at least. But again, the ethics of it. So now we're doing something great with the quality measures. Don't get me wrong. We're treating the masses. <laughs> but then at an ethical level, when we're patient-centered, remember that ethical patient-focused doctor? Is that ethical patient-focused doctor gonna say no and be non-compliant? And if they did, how long are they going to be employed? We talked a, lot of, a little bit about the cost saving. I think good stewardship, good stewardship equals cost saving, and that improves the overall um, care in society. I'm going to, I have at least three more topics to hit, but I'm going to mention hospital. So initially, one of the ethical issues with hospice and post-acute care was the phishing. When hospices provide, when private hospices provided personal care attendants, and they, so that was one incentive. <laughs> and then the other, while they were in the facility, they looked around and said, how about that one? How about that one? Can you look into their job? So that stopped now because yeah, there was major pushback from providers <laughs> that we would not do that. But the, there was an ethical issue with the uh, PCA services. So if a PCA comes in, if a CNA comes in for one resident, can they be used for the other residents? And if that's the case, that's a conflict of interest, right? Because you're increasing the staff ratio for them, the facility has an incentive to use hospice. Now, look at the cost between 2007 and 2015. It went from 10 billion to 15 billion a year. Okay, it's 50% increase. 
and was actually cycling, and I'm a pro-hospice patient, I'm a geriatrician, so all geriatricians are pro-palliative care, but your highest uh, payment goes towards patients with Alzheimer's, not patients with cancer. Now, how long do you think it would take Medicare to figure that out, that it's a problem, okay? Because with more than 70, 80% of the population in nursing homes having dementia, what if a lot of them got more hospice? That would bankrupt that system, right? And they won't have money to spend on the people who actually need it. So next time you're thinking of hospice, if you say, you know, we want it because the companionship would be great. That companion is costing $300 a day. Do you really need it that bad? You will have cases where you do. But just think about it. Like, do we really need it in every case? The other hospice issue, of course, the code status, I, the ethical issue, where code status uh, remains full code under hospice, okay, because they don't want to lose the client. And under the law, it's actually allowed. But how much push or how much education is there to push that discussion forward and say, look, look at the principle of palliative care, look at full code. You're 99, you have cancer, you have whatever. How do you do that? How do you reconcile the two? And try to work through that. But I find that in, there was a kind of a general principle of uh, quick thing on medication, hospices take Alzheimer's patients, but then deny the medications that are not cancer or anything related. If you're taking them based on a glo uh, broad diagnosis, you've got to cover the broad meds. And it's one of those system ethics because Medicare Part D, you know, spends $291 million a year. And they save a hundred million a year by not paying hospice meds. You know how much money we're spending on Medicare? Seven hundred million billion dollars. So it's 0.7 trillion a year. And that little thing with the medication that creates a lot of hassle and sometimes a lack of access and an ethical issue is, you know, we're talking about 300 million. Um, how about therapies? I'm going to mention quick about therapies. Uh, there are facilities in Part B, uh, assisted living facilities, where Part B cap, you know where Part B cap is. So they stopped qualifying for hospice in September. I went to a facility like that we were considering to take on as a facility, and I said, well, uh, that, that's an odd <laughs> issue that all your patients meeting their cap by September, the entire facility utilizes therapy that way. And what is being done now, and it's actually evidence-based, ironically, that there's a screening process that can be done and a referral initiated without the provider's involvement. So the provider comes in at the end with the S bar where it says, can we have therapy? And you say yes. And then they'll have it for two, three weeks, Three, four months later, they get screened again, and so on. That's an issue. I'm going to mention quickly about ACOs. I'm just, I want to just show you on, on the ACO thing. Remember, we spend $700 billion a year on Medicare. Okay. So to about $200 billion Part A, $200 billion Part B, $200 billion uh, Part C, which is the Medicare Advantage plan, and about $100 billion on Part D. Just keep that in mind, okay? And I'm off by a few numbers, but that's, it's no more than 5% range up or down. How much did we save on ACOs, which have been around for almost a decade now? We saved 466 million, okay? And I think um, half of the ACOs didn't save even that. They didn't save any money. Half of the ACOs. Now, that was a big push. That was a big entity. And I'm only bringing this up because it also creating ethical issues that eventually, hopefully, that those ethical concerns will be brought in. Now, how many of you are familiar with the Stark Laws? Now, Stark Laws for physicians 
are to prevent conflict of interest regarding patient referrals. Okay. Now, when they use, I don't know if any of you remember when nursing homes used to have five medical directors, right? Why did they do that? Because they got those doctors patients. So they hired the medical directors to get the doctors patients. And they created the Stark Laws. You can't pay a doctor unless you're getting something in return that has to be documented. Now, don't get me started on that. That's a different topic. Like that where, you know, they want to calculate only the meeting time and not the time they you're on call for them and all that. But if you <laughs> if you look at the ACOs now, and I, that's actually, let me hold that off for a second. If you look at ACOs and compare them to physicians, so if an entity has a nursing home and a hospital and a rehab and a home health and the referral process is done preferentially, if you put a doctor instead of the word hospital or entity or facility, you would have an immediate illegal action. It would be considered illegal, not unethical one step further than unethical. It's illegal. So w that closed networks that exist now as, as the um, systems becoming a little bit more consolidated to control quality and control, more importantly, to control cost. If you're saving 400 million a year out of 700 billion and you're creating a conflict of interest, in terms of referrals, and the patients are not getting as many options as they used to. Okay. Is it worth looking at it again? I think it is. And we eventually will see stark laws for hospitals. Now, that actually, sh uh, and one quick thing is that stark laws for physicians still being updated. Every once in a while, they update them. And I say, well, why are they being updated? We don't have, we don't make referrals anymore, right? We don't, we're not the referral source, the hospital is, <laughs> okay? But it shows how weak our representation is, okay? And how strong theirs is. That that's still an issue for doctors even though it's obsolete. Uh, and last that I'm gonna leave you with this is who protects the people who wanna be ethical? If you, are ethical right now, sometimes you're in conflict with your employers. Sometimes, I'm not, there are a lot of, you know, great facilities out there and I think Maine compares favorably with many other states that I experienced. I've seen Missouri, Connecticut, uh, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and I, I love me and we're doing great, but there's always this element of, okay, so if you do this, you're now not compliant with the protocols. Or worse, if 30% of your pay out of Medicare is based on patient satisfaction, how many families can you antagonize? Right? You'll end up being more compliant. And that, this is Egypt, and I took that on a rooftop, and it's a cemetery. So that's the old cemetery and some of those graves house the old sultans and everything. And they're just open, you go in, you pay 25 cents and you go up the roof. Yeah. If you want the emails, contact me later. <laughs> so, and that's it, I'm gonna pause for questions.